Hello, I'm Janice Karen, Director of Policy, Technology, and Innovation at the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium, or MHTC. I run our Data Governance Collaborative, also known as the DGC. We start each of our weekly meetings with a series of industry quick updates to learn about new and proposed regulations, laws, standards, industry initiatives, and other activity. Join us for this week's updates. And if you'll go to the first update, so uh, this is the Spring 2024 Unified Agenda, where the federal government lays out plans for regulatory documents. Uh, and as you can see, there's this, this goes on for another page as well. Uh, there's a lot of upcoming activity that might be of interest to folks um, looking at health data and health IT. Uh, the first one, which will be a final rule coming out in October, was interesting because they're making some adjustments and standardizing the format of NDC codes. Um, this fall, apparently they are not as standardized as one would hope something that is an official code set and standard would be. So that's a good move. Um, OIG is also reducing um, oversight, exceptions to oversight so that they have more oversight authority over various federal health plans. So that's something to look at. Um, uh, the MA uh, Medicare Advantage Part D payment policies. So there'll be some drug related rules in there. Uh, we've talked about this before, but the um, first rule covering advanced explanation of benefits, uh, as well as some potentially other No Surprises Act provisions that we don't know the specifics of, is still slated for March of next year. The HIPAA updates uh, to X12-8020 um, proposal for that is now slated for December. Um, this next one actually is a big one. We've uh, Drugs have been com coming up a lot lately. Uh, their CMS has put on the docket with no details whatsoever, um, a rule that basically says is for interoperability and prior authorization for drugs. As, and all they say about it is that it's a follow-up to the regular prior interoperability and prior auth rule. And it was prompted by the multitude of comments they got about drugs being excluded from that rule. So there's no, no idea what will be in that, but a proposed rule for that is currently slated for November. The attachments rule has come back uh, from the dead and a final rule is now on, listed for November as well. And again, with um, keeping on the drug front, NCPDP standards, all of these are live links to the entry in the unified agenda. Most of these don't have much information at all, um, but if the dates change or something like that, you can uh, monitor. So um, mental health parity, there's another rule for that that's going final sometime this month. Um, the independent dispute resolution operations, we looked at that rule, um, the proposed rule, I think in January, it might have been last December, um, but that's that's getting finalized in November. And they're also um, going to have an interim final rule with um, changing some of the operating rules for HIPAA. And that is scheduled for next March. Why don't you go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll just keep sort of um, looking at some of these and then we can talk about them as a group if anyone has any questions. There is a new HIPAA security proposed rule that is being planned for December. Again, no idea what's going to be in it on strengthening cybersecurity. There's another non-discrimination on the basis of disability rule um, planned for next June. That's the farthest out date I saw for any rule, by the way. Um, standards for data exchange for social service programs may have an impact on SCOH related items or some health equity programs. And so I thought I would put that on as something to possibly pay attention to. Um, unspecified Privacy Act regulation updates. And similarly, they, ha they have this listed as something called a comments review without any further action. So it's not clear if there will be actual further action that's specifically planned, but the FTC is supposedly at least internally taking some further action on um, updates to the Children's Privacy Act. That's COPPA for those of you who may have heard that abbreviation. 
Um, and it's unclear exactly what that might entail. So each of these links goes to the specific page for that rule um, in the federal, in the unified agenda. And the link at the bottom there goes to the main agenda page. That main page, this is the entire federal government. So you can select by agency, um, search by term, et cetera. So is, does anyone have any question about any of the specific rules that got highlighted? Want to comment on anything? Do you want to flip back to the previous page just for a second, just to remind people what was on it? Again, and then just as a, like those two November rules from CMS are probably uh, the, 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 the next big, big things that we will and and maybe, maybe the independent dispute resolution operations rule ha actually had some requirements that were for specific um, use of X12 for some no surprises X stuff. So that also might have a big impact. Uh, but so that November timeframe, which may bleed into December or even January, but the stuff that's currently listed for November uh, really appears to be the next big tranche of stuff that will be big rules that require some effort to read and look at and interpret and apply and possibly comment on for the ones that are proposed rules. All right, I'm going to give folks another chance to to ask or comment, and if not, we're going to move on. All right, let's move on then. Uh, so speaking of privacy, uh, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts House has unanimously passed a location shield bill. Um, it was passed like a day after it was proposed, so it went through pretty quickly. And <laughs> it's basically a prohibition against selling cell phone data, um, collecting around visits to healthcare facilities that offer reproductive or gender affirming care. It does not specify, as far as I can tell, that that there's any requirement that the person be getting reproductive or gender affirming care while they're at that location, but just that the location itself offers it. So for instance, if you're at a hospital that offers any kind of care of that sort, um, any data that says that you are at that hospital appears to be covered by this. There are a few permissible reasons for sharing. Um, the, the main one that they call out is, um, is for emergency services purposes. So if they need to share location information from your cell phone um, to respond to an EMS call or something like that, they would that would be allowed, which makes sense. And um, you can also explicitly consent to have that information shared. And they, there will be a state regulation from the attorney generals to do the actual implementation details, but they specify that the location data um, that can be tracked to within a range of 1,850 feet or less from those locations. So the bill still has to go to the Senate. There's only a few weeks left in the legislative session. Um, so you never know what's going to happen, but the anticipation is that it will pass and get signed into law. So any questions or thoughts or comments about that? All right, well, hearing none, I will just add one more aside myself and then we'll move on. I personally would like to see this be a wider thing um, that doesn't allow it more generally either, um, but um, this is a nice first step in that direction. All right, let's move on to the next update. So Medicare has put out its hospital outpatient and ambulatory care payment proposed rule for calendar year 2025. And the reason that I'm calling it out is that in addition to a whole bunch of payment adjustments, there are changes to a variety of quality measure programs at CMS, including a change, a proposed change to the way that star ratings are calculated. Um, and so we can certainly uh, look at changes to those other programs if people want, but the big change that I wanted to call out was that they are now proposing that if any hospital 
um, is in the lower 25% of the safety of care measure um, group, <laughs> they cannot receive a five-star rating, even if everything else, all of their other ratings would have qualified them for it. So they want to prioritize the safety measures and patient safety by giving basically um, penalizing you for doing badly in that category. Any comments, thoughts, questions there? All right, well, let's keep going then. Move on to the next slide, please. <laughs> um, uh, as, as, as mentioned earlier, drugs seem to be um, getting a lot of attention, which is great. And another way that's happening is through um, questions and concerns about the role of PBMs. And as part of that, FTC has been doing an investigation of PBMs for some time, and they have an interim report that has been um, that was released um, on accessibility and affordability of prescription drugs, um, and particularly how PBMs affect that. And there, so there were, uh, it was a fairly, um, it was not very complimentary of PBMs, uh, as in general. Um, and they did they point out two pieces of data that were probably not surprising to anyone on this call, but still startling to see in writing which is that there are six PBMs that manage 95% of all of the prescriptions filled in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. I actually thought that, 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 that the number of PBMs was that did that was smaller. So I was surprised that it, that it was six, but the, it's probably three for like 90% of them. And the other five is another 3% is my guess, or maybe it's 85 and 10, but in any case, uh, the six, six, largest PBMs manage 95% of all of the prescriptions of any kind that are filled in the United States. And the other piece that they pointed out sort of upfront is that they found that 30% of Americans ration or skip doses of prescription medications, mainly because of cost. So that's not a shock. We've talked a lot about um, price transparency and uh, issues around cost of medical care, but that's still a pretty large number. And then two specific things that they called out about PBM behavior that they found concerning um, or the ability to arbitrarily hike the price of drugs, especially expensive drugs like those treating cancer, and the ability to control who sells drugs so that um, PBMs can squeeze out smaller operators especially those in rural areas um, where there aren't many other options. And I will just as a piece of data for that, it's certainly not new, but uh, probably around 12 or 13 years ago, the local drugstore that's about two blocks from where I live that I used to use basically got pushed out of business um, because all of the plants around here started requiring that you get your drugs filled at either CVS or Walmart, um, Walgreens rather. And they were basically unable to stay in business as a drugstore at that point. So this is definitely a real thing. And uh, so the FTC will presumably continue on this vein, do a final report, and presumably take some actions within the scope of what they're allowed to do. Any questions, thoughts, concerns there? All right, well, let's keep going then. And again, on the, the medication front, ONC has put out a blog piece on the evolution of e-prescribing. And it's sort of a bit of history with a little bit of looking forward. And so um, they kind of give this interesting timeline of the history of e-prescribing of both um, regular prescription drugs and also controlled substances and sort of where things are now in terms of usage. And then looking ahead, some of the goals of HTI2 um, on the e-prescribing and real-time pharmacy benefits front. So it was a really, it was short, it's short. It's not very long. I thought it was interesting. Um, it is very much a rah, rah, go look at HTI2 type of thing, but, but within that context, it still had a lot of 
interesting information. And I actually was not familiar with all of the histories, so I found that part interesting too. So if you'd like to um, go into more detail on any of that, you can read the piece. It's linked in the slide. And I don't know if anyone would like to comment or have any questions about that now. All right, if you'll go to the next slide and pause there. I hope you learned a lot from our quick updates. If you're interested in finding out more about the DGC and its other activities, email me at dgc at myhealthdata.org. That email address is also on your screen.